you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. Go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification. You can see all the wonderful things that we're uh, reading or reviewing on the Chris Voss Show. You can see, go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all those different places and see everything we're taking and doing. We've got a brilliant roundup today. Uh, we've got the authors of the new book coming out July 8th, 2021. The name of the book is called The Key Man, How the Global Elite Was Duped by a Capitalist Fairy Tale. This is going to be a pretty interesting read to talk about today. We have the two authors of the book, Simon Clark and Will Lauch. Simon Clark is a journalist for the Wall Street Journal in London. He has reported on a wide range of investigative stories which have led him to the poppy fields of Afghanistan, the copper mines of Congo, and to lots of banks in the city of London. He was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 2016. He lives in Sussex, England. Blouch is a former Wall Street Journal reporter based in London and New York. And before that, he was based in Brussels, where he wrote about the European politics. And he's currently at law school in London. Welcome to the show, guys. Congratulations on the launch of your new book. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. And thanks for coming, guys. So give us your plugs, dot coms, where people can find you on the interwebs and find out more about who you guys are and what you're doing. So we've written a, a true crime story about globalization gone wrong, the key man. The key man is Arif Nakvi, who out of Dubai built the largest private equity firm operating in developing countries and emerging markets across Africa. South Asia and Latin America. And his pitch was that he would make money for investors, end global poverty at the same time. And with this pitch, he raised billions of dollars from billionaires like Bill Gates and governments. The US government was an investor. UK and France were investors. US pension funds in Washington, Louisiana, Texas, and Hawaii were investors. Wow. So he raised this money. And the Department of Justice has accused him of stealing quite a lot of it. And now he faces up to 291 years in jail if found guilty. Hmm. He says he's uh, not guilty. Um, the case is ongoing. So did, so did uh, Bernie Madoff. Do you, you want to tell us why you guys wrote this book and what motivated you guys? What's What got you guys to sink your teeth in? Sure. So we first started reporting on this story in January 2018. So about three and a half years ago, we were both at the time working in London as reporters covering finance and specifically private equity. I received an anonymous tip off from a whistleblower that things were not all going so well at Abrage and that some investors, including the Gates Foundation and a unit of the World Bank, were investigating where hundreds of millions of dollars of their money had gone. Abraj was managing their money because they'd raised a fund which uh, totaled $1 billion, which was meant to build hospitals uh, and diagnostic centres in Africa and Asia. And yeah, we received this email and that's really where the story began. Three and a half years later, we've got a book which is coming out next week. Uh, and there's a lot in between which we'd like to fill you in on over the course of the next half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So how does this whole thing begin? What? Who's this guy and what's the origin story of, of how this whole thing starts out? Arif Nakvi was born in Pakistan in 1960, a former you know, British colony. And he's an ambitious young man who's going to Karachi Grammar School, which was founded by the British over 100 years before. So he's going to an English language school and he's an excellent scholar he speaks english very well he goes from there to the london school of economics and then he goes into the financial world 
working in London and then Karachi in Pakistan and then in Saudi Arabia before he finds his best working environment in Dubai, which is open to people from all over the world to go and work there and start firms. And that's what he did. He, he was a very successful investor, very shrewd initially. And uh, from 2002 onwards, he builds his company Abraj into a very large investment vehicle, raising money from the US, from Europe, buying companies and hospitals in Pakistan, India, Kenya, South Africa. And along the way, his pitch evolves from just making money, which is hard, to making money and ending poverty at Mm -hmm. the same time, which is even harder. The argument being that if he invests in hospitals, he's providing health services, or if he's investing in food companies, he's creating jobs, providing new products in countries where they're, they're lacking. Some of that did happen, but there was financial goings on as well within the firm, which meant that money was was not exactly all going where it should have been going. Mm. So Will, as he said, got a got an anonymous email from someone who we still don't know who that is in February 2018. And this person laid out problems within the company. Because we don't know who that person is, we couldn't write an article based on this email. But what this email did was gave us a tip that there's something going on. And what we did with that was we then went and contacted dozens of people within a branch, their investors, regulators, to find out exactly what was going on, to gather evidence, documents, and then publish articles. And that's what we did. And this is pretty interesting. Is this is this like a Toronto story? Like, how long does this go on where this gentleman raises money and dupes everyone for a while? It It is indeed a Theranos story gone large in the Middle East. In fact, mm-hmm. our literary agent is the same guy for Bad Blood, which was written by a colleague of ours at the Wall Street Journal. And he rang me up and said, this story is like Bad Blood would you like to write a book about it? And so we said yes. So it wasn't actually our idea to write the book. It was actually our agents. Oh, wow. There you go. So is this a big story? Because a lot of us haven't heard about this story in America. And, of course, we've been busy with our own own kind of newsmakers. But is this a big story overseas in England, Dubai? Or is this still coming out? Or or are are these billionaires trying to keep it quiet because it's embarrassing? It's a... It's a very big story in Dubai because Abraj was like the spirit of Dubai. Arif Mm -hmm. is a very articulate public speaker. And like many private equity tycoons, he he enjoyed publicity and being on the public stage. Mm -hmm. He was a constant presence at Davos, the World Economic Forum, and in other forums around the world. The story went large in 2018 when we put it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about the the alleged fraud and theft and and bribery that had gone on. The issue is that private equity is a very secretive industry and a lot or none of the investors want to talk about it publicly for two reasons. One is there's a huge amount of ongoing litigation So there's a criminal indictment of six senior executives. The SEC has also launched a civil case. So none of these investors, the World Bank, the Washington State Pension Fund, the Gates Foundation, UK government, Bank of America, none of them want to talk about this for that reason. They also don't want to talk about it because I think they don't want to attract attention to it because it makes them look like they possibly weren't doing their jobs as well as they should have been doing. We think it's a very important story because capital and money moves around the world. The U.S. is the the beating heart of the global economy. Money is moving in and out of the United States for various reasons. And it needs to do that in a proper way. And we're trying to shine a light on some very dark corners of the global economy to show how money is misused, how it can be used to genuinely promote living conditions in countries where conditions are not great and how sometimes people are hijacking those financial flows for their own gain. Wow. And so it was a lot of this money 
that was donated to these to like charities and stuff to give to Bill Gates and said give that to that other guy. And that's one of the things that's really surprising about this whole thing is it, or controversial maybe is because this was money that people donated at goodwill to the foundations or something or no the Gates Foundation money is from Bill Gates's personal fortune. It mm. has over a hundred billion dollars in it. It also has billions from Warren Buffett. The issue though, this is all investment capital. It's all money which is seeking a commercial return. The issue is that it was supposed to be deployed to provide demonstrable social improvements as well as a profit, and in some case, and it didn't. And there's a there, as a result of that, there's a huge loss of trust in the, the possibility that money can be moved around the world and deployed in a way that is useful. And so how much total is this guy run off with? So allegedly almost as much as $800 million. Wow. Um, somebody just, if somebody just wants to send me a million, they can end poverty and also enrich the world. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, but I'm keeping it. <laughs> I think that shows some of the genius of this man, the fact that he was able to go to some of the world's richest and smartest people and convince them to give him so much money. Like his story was very seductive, as Simon has said. Like if, if I went to you and tried to raise a hundred pounds from you, you probably wouldn't give me very much. Arif, I'll, I'll write a check to you. I'll give you a check. Well, you can, check. We, can, can you please do that after we after we get off this? But Arif in total managed to raise nearly fourteen billion dollars. And so how one can look at it is if you look at like the Wolf of Wall Street, for instance, he managed to dupe fairly unsophisticated investors. They were normally you or me that were looking to make a bit of money with our, with our pension, with our IRS thing, investing money personally. What Arif did, he went to literally people whose entire job it is to invest money sensibly and to make good returns. Like they didn't have hedge funds and investors, but lots of very sophisticated banks like Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, lots of institutions that are very smart. They gave Arif money. They expected to make returns. And now some of the money has gone missing, at least according to the U.S. Department of Justice. So this gives me a good idea because I've got that Moderna vaccine here. Let me call Bill, see if I can get him to pick up here. I'm just kidding. The, uh, this is crazy, man. Uh, that's a lot of money. If it hadn't been for this tipster, Tipping you guys off, would maybe this still be undercover of whatever? I imagine once the people started filing charges or something, it would come out. Or technically, the charges that are filed are because of you guys, right? It, it, it would have been hard for this not to have blown up in some way publicly because there was U.S. government money invested. There was Bill Gates's charitable foundation money invested, and there were U.S. pension fund money. So... American firefighters, policemen, teachers, their money was in, invested in abroad. And that's why these charges have been leveled at the firm. US authorities take this very seriously. It is possible that if, the, if we hadn't been tipped off, it might have imploded in a more secretive way and people wouldn't really have understood exactly what was going on. But we've spent, we spent the best part of 2018 working on this. It took us six months from the tip off to finally get someone to hand over documents, bank statements from, win from within a branch, which proved the theft and the fraud. So it is possible that if we hadn't been working so hard, it would have been a bit of a more of a quiet story. And he won the uh, support of President Obama's administration and the chief of the British government that compared him to Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. How did that work? He he got in with everybody. I, th I think that's really part of the part of the again the genius of him. Like I just said, I used the example of myself trying to raise money from yourself. So how Arif was able to immerse himself within these financial institutions and with governments was because he was incredibly smart. Like the message that he was you know, giving was obviously a very attractive one. So the US government, like OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corps, they saw Arif as a means of being able to tackle extremism in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. so they launched this big kind of campaign during the Obama administration 
to tackle extremism and terrorism by helping build the economy in countries overseas, like in the Middle East. And so how they thought they could do that was by investing money, creating jobs. There wouldn't be so much youth unemployment. And so all the people that would maybe have gone and, you know, joined ISIS would actually have jobs working at software companies, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so Arif positioned himself strategically as a kind of conduit for money from the US government to go to these areas, which obviously had some social issues going on there. Mm -hmm. And so they saw him as a foreign policy tool effect. And then it really, and so in total, I think they pledged, the US government specifically pledged around $500 million to this man. Yeah, and it didn't end so well, but it was a nice idea. So you guys chose the, the title, The Key Man. What, was there a reason you chose The Key Man as the title? Yeah, so there's two reasons. The key man is actually a term used in private equity for the heads of private equity firms. If the key man or the key woman leaves the firm, then investors can be entitled to have their money back because it means the firm doesn't have a future. Mm. So there's a term used in private equity. Also, because of Arif's pitch, which is, I will make you money and end poverty, it seemed to elevate him as a key man in, in human affairs. He was at the center of an incredibly influential political and financial network. Jo he was trying to hire John Kerry to join his firm after John Kerry ceased to be Secretary of State. So in, in many ways, the key man title seemed to be absolutely appropriate for him. And, and I remember, I think I remember this conversation during the Obama administration where I heard there was this theory that if we could just get everyone jobs in the middle, they quit, they, they join, getting blown up is about the only job over there sometimes in Palestine, which is sad. The, and, and, and they, they have this people promising all sorts of stuff. But if they had just solid jobs, there would be hopefully some stability. This is pretty extraordinary. What are some shocking things or maybe do you want to tease out some things in the book that uh, readers want to look forward to when they pick it up? Sure. So when Arif was finally arrested at Heathrow Airport in London in April 2018, he was carrying four passports. Wow. Two of them were Pakistani passports. One it was a St. Kitts and Nevis passport. And the fourth one was the most interesting one. It was an Interpol passport. So Interpol is the global police organization that connects police authorities in every country. Mm -hmm. and, and Arif had an Interpol passport because he was on the board of the Interpol Foundation, which is supposed to... <laughs> To raise money for Interpol. And when the policeman stepped forward to say that he was under arrest, he said to the policeman, you can't arrest me because there's not a red notice out from me. A red notice is an Interpol yeah. warrant to alert people that a person is wanted. And he said he checked with Interpol before getting on the plane whether or not there was a red notice and there was not a red notice. Mm -hmm. And the policeman said to him, I don't need a red notice to arrest you. You're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> nice try so, for diplomatic immunity, huh? Yeah, there, there were, we had, sources were telling us that he had been trying to get a position within the Pakistan government, which may have afforded him immunity. But he, yeah. he didn't get it. He has you know, been a funder of senior politicians in 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 Pakistan, the current Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, his second wife, his former wife, wrote in her autobiography that Imran told her that Arif was one of his main political funders. And in our reporting, we've shown that, that he was attempting to make a payment or had considered making a payment of $20 million to another Prime Minister of Pakistan as he was trying to sell a major asset in the country. So he was extremely well networked in the global financial and political elite. Mm -hmm. Where does his, where does his uh, theft come out on the list of uh, people who've de debunked investors and stuff? I just pulled up Bernie Madoff and I guess his was about $65, $70 billion. So where does this guy fall in the, in the uh, list of big world investor threat, uh, Rip off. He's up there. Abraj managed 
14 billion dollars i don't actually have a league table of the, the biggest thefts in the world but <laughs> this is a big one those are the next 10 books or whatever that's, that's a good that's a good that would be a good league table to compile <laughs> you're giving me an idea there yeah do they is there any chance these guys are going to get their money back or some of it or is it all did did somebody just go have too much fun with it the, 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 so the, Abraj managed a number of funds and there were investments in companies. So it wasn't as if no investments were made. There oh. were investments made. And some of those funds, they're going to get a fair amount of their money back. Yeah. Because of, of the $780 million that was transferred to, to Arif, $385 million is still missing according to the liquidators of the firm have they extradited him to the america yet or is he still in london he's, he's still in london i think he's got one more appeal to the to the high court in the uk before he will be ex but the home secretary in the uk has approved his extradition so the u.s is going to take precedent on the charges then the u.s made the charges okay. the uk arrested him okay. on behalf of the u.s mm -hmm. um and when eventually there should be a trial in New York, and not we don't know when that is because we don't know when, if and when he will finally be extradited. Could be next year, could be the year after. Okay. Uh, Theranos Elizabeth Holmes trial is taking a long time to unfold as well. That's a deal too that I remember watching the whole thing come around and you saw i think it was a george schultz or there was somebody that really validated that that was a politician and a money guy and yeah and, it was uh, schultz. so it was george yeah. schultz yeah and they brought in all the power guys and i think wasn't prince in there the it was the betsy devos family they were in that thing too Ruth got, Mother was was a big uh was a bigger investor i think in, in town yeah i think they got they were on the hook for, I don't know, it was a hundred million or maybe it was a hundred million total that she ripped off or a hundred billion or I don't know. These are check numbers way out of my league. <laughs> well, that, that's a part of the secret to succeeding at least temporarily in these situations is association with famous and apparently reputable people is very important so arif would tell people i'm i'm on the board of interpol and mm -hmm. i'm uh i'm a well networked person you can trust me he he had bill gates and in his invest in his fund he had bank of america so people took comfort from that you mm -hmm. know they would say oh you know bill gates is an investor in a branch so it must be okay it's a it, there's an element of confidence trick in 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 that and and, and that you can build and build by using that technique until it all falls down. And a big part of Arif's confidence trick as well was his philanthropy. Like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have pledged to give away lots of their money. Arif gave away, he set up a charitable foundation, which he pledged at least $100 million of his own money. And I think that was like one thing. And so he set up a charitable initiative with Bill Gates in Pakistan. And I think if someone is giving away that much money, it's very difficult to dispute the fact that they would do that. So if, mm -hmm. if I didn't have a lot of money, I wouldn't give away $100 million of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that probably brought a lot of com comfort for people, just his incredibly lavish and generous uh, donations that he made to charity. Mm -hmm. I've, got a, I've got $100 million I'm giving away. It's just off screen right here. It's right in this general area over here, and I'm giving that away. So, Bill, call me, Bill. Call me. You're not picking up. How much of this comes down to personality? Because it seems like these guys, Bernie Madoff, there was a Theranos. The, the Theranos woman had this air of, she tried to take on the air of uh, Steve Jobs. She wore the turtleneck and everything and had this weird sort of diet and stuff. I remember reading it just going, this is cracked out. But people bought into it. The, and it sounds like this guy was pretty, had one hell of a personality in being able to swindle these folks. Yeah, he was... He's very charismatic, he's very articulate, very cultured, very intelligent. And actually, he did wear a black turtleneck at the uh, final <laughs> or end of his extradition trial where the judge told him that he was going to be extradited. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> In your turtleneck, too. <laughs> People normally go one of two ways. Bernie Madoff was super secretive, never really did any press at all. Whereas Elizabeth Holmes went very much for the, I'm going to get on stage in front of everyone, tell everyone what I'm doing. Arif was very much in the Elizabeth Holmes school. He was out there. So a good little story from the book is 
whilst we were preparing to publish our first story and we contacted Abraj and the firm to let them know that we we're preparing a story about Arif allegedly misusing Bill Gates' foundation's money. Arif actually went to Davos in the World Economic Forum and sat on stage and debated with Bill Gates, even though he knew, and Bill Gates also knew, that he had potentially taken hundreds of millions of dollars of investors' money. And that was one of the things that I always found amazing about people like Arif and Elizabeth Holmes is how they have the, the balls to get up on stage and you're in, the, you're in trouble and to just sit there so coolly and calmly and collectively and debate. And there's actually a point in the conversation of Gates where he actually almost lectures Bill Gates. And it, wow. is, it is watching that video whilst we knew or we had suspicions that something was going on. I just thought this guy really is a fascinating character. Definitely. It, I imagine it, 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 any sort of long con or grift is it takes, you've got to have that charisma to fool people and probably part of a bit of a narcissistic personality. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it's interesting. Note to self, take charis, charis, charisma classes and also learn to speak. So this is quite interesting. Do you, do you see him basically going to jail? This is locked down. It's just a matter of going through the courts then. Is there any ambiguous nature to this that he might be able to find a way to wiggle off? He's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, but there is plenty of evidence that wrongdoing took place at a barrage. The Department of Justice has indicted six former Abraj executives, including Arif. One of them has already pleaded guilty. And in addition to that, the Dubai financial regulator fined Abraj $315 million for misleading investors. So he's in a tight spot. He is resisting extradition, doesn't want to go to the US. So it's, it, but it, we, it's not our job to, to predict what will happen in the justice system. But uh, he's in a tight spot. It should be interesting. Anything more you guys want to tease out in the book to get people to pre-order that? I think this is a story that, that Americans will recognize. It's a story of ambition and money and drive. And it's playing out all over the world. So it's a great storybook about private equity, Barbarians at the Gate, written mm -hmm. by... Wall Street Journal journalist 20, 30 years ago. This is a private equity story about, about a great charismatic character, about money, about ambition, and it's unfolding in Dubai, Pakistan, Ghana, in Africa, in London, in New York. So it will take the readers into new and fascinating places through a story that they will recognize and understand. In fact, we had Brian uh, Burrow on the show for his new book, Forget the Alamo. Uh, yeah, I listened to it. It was good. Yeah, yeah. great guys. So it was wild to have all three of them on screen and, and juggle the two. Man, I tell you, you want to you wanna get interesting comments on YouTube, you attack the Alamo in Texas. And uh, <laughs> that episode has seen some comments, let me tell you. So, guys, give us your plugs so people can order up the book and find you guys in the internet to get to know you better and uh, get that book ordered up for its July 8th release. It's actually July the 6th in oh. the U.S. Uh, oh. HarperCollins is publishing in the U.S. July the 6th. Okay. Uh, it's available in all good bookstores and online. It's mm -hmm. actually uh, July the 8th in the United Kingdom. Where ah. the Penguin is the publisher. Ah, so that's what happened. I clicked the link. It took me to the UK version. It does say Amazon.co.uk here. So July 6th, guys, you can get it before the people in England. So just beat them and your book club. Uh, to be the first on your block to say you read it. Do we get both you guys in for your plugs? Yeah, sure. I'm on Twitter at William underscore Louch, spelled L-O-U-C-H, and add me on LinkedIn if you ever want to talk about anything interesting that's going on in the world of finance. There you guys go. Thank you guys for spending some time with us and uh, coming on the show. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks very much. Thank you. And uh, also, go order The Key Man, How the Global Elite Was Duped by a Capitalist Fairy Tale. This is just amazing to me. You think about the, all this wasted money, and then, of course, none of this goes to help poverty at all. It's just been thrown out the window, really, and 
cooked and burned or whatever they can't claw back. That's a crazy story, man. Meanwhile, most of us go down to the bank and say, hey, can you loan us 50 bucks? And they're like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> but yeah, if anybody does need any money from me, if you take a check, that's fine. Anyway, guys, we certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. Thanks to our uh, live audience for uh, saying hello as we go along. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss, seeing everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Also go to, let's see, youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. And all of course, we have LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all those different places you can see where we're at with the show. Thanks for everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time.